Okay, to all our friends out there, this is Death Penalty Focus. This is our summer webinar series. Um, I will make a few announcements while we're waiting for everyone to jump on. Um, this, matter, this webinar is being recorded. Its uh, link will be published to you after the recording. And so I'm waiting to see how many people are here at the moment. Okay. Okay. Um, welcome to the Death Penalty Focus Summer 2020 webinar series. Uh, we've reached webinar number five, which is a discussion with former Illinois Governor George Ryan, uh, journalist, author, Maurice Posley, about their new book, Until I Could Be Sure. Here we go. Um, before we start, I'd like to thank all of you who are here for being with us. Um, during this webinar, please send your questions through our Q&A box below. Um, we'll save up all the questions until the end of the presentation, and then we will go through a question and answer session. Um, when you submit questions, you may not be aware that other people are posting too. So often we get dozens and dozens of questions through the time frame. So keep on posting. You know, as new thoughts come to your mind, yeah, put them in the box there and I'll get to them. So um, for all of you uh, who are just signing in, welcome to Death Penalty Focus. We're a national nonprofit dedicated to information and substantive dialogue about the death penalty. Each. Each. Your contributions allow us to put on this webinar series, so you can donate by tax to 56512 and enter the word end executions, all one word. Um, donate on our website at deathpenalty.org or on our Facebook page or Twitter feed. Um, we urge you to be active on social media. We need to raise the visibility of the death penalty as a national and moral problem. Um, when you use, when you're on social media, use hashtags, hashtag death penalty, hashtag end the death penalty, hashtag end federal executions. And if you follow us on Facebook and on Twitter, you can see that we use these all the time. So feel free to retweet or follow us, share, uh, share all of our material with everyone you want. I, this is a particularly stressful time. Um, as we scan the political horizon, the matter of the death penalty neither stands on its own, nor does it fall into the traditional right to life movement. Um, this is causing a lot of us a lot of consternation right now. Um, next week, there will be two executions. The first victim, William McCroy, will be killed on Tuesday, September 22nd, and the second victim, young Christopher Vialba, will be killed on September 24th. On September 23rd, the day between these two killings, Attorney General Bill Barr is to receive an award at the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast. The award, the Christopher Fidelis Lacey Award, is an award to someone whose life exemplifies the teachings of the Catholic Church and the life of Christ. Um, the executions of William McCroy and Christopher Bialva are under the direct orders of William Barr. The leadership of the Catholic Church does not seem to recognize that prisoners have a right to life too. I'm asking in this call to action, please write the bishops in your area. Please write to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and urge them to oppose this award to William Barr and to boycott the conference. Um, if you have questions, please send them to me, nancy at deathpenalty.org. So thank you for that. It's really a, it's just crazy to think that William Barr is going to get a Catholic award between two executions. So on to our webinar. Today we have four speakers discussing um, death penalty moratorium and particularly Governor Ryan and his death penalty moratorium in Illinois. Um, our featured speaker is former Illinois Governor George Ryan. Um, with Governor Ryan is Maurice Posley, author, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, and co-author with Governor Ryan of their forthcoming book, Until I Could Be Sure, How I Ended the Death Penalty in Illinois. Our third speaker is the guiding light of death penalty focus, a lifetime advocate uh, for death penalty abolition and our local hero, Mike Farrell. 
Also with us is Laura Schaefer, a staff attorney for the ABA Death Penalty Representation Project. Um, she is also an expert in clemency. So, Governor Ryan, welcome. Thank you. You were elected as governor of Illinois in 1998. Um, you were a conservative Republican governor in a death penalty state. And by your own account, when you were elected, you were a pro-death penalty governor. About a, a year after the election in January 2000, you declared a moratorium on executions. Later, you pardoned four death row inmates based on actual innocence and later commuted the death sentences of 167 death row inmates. So I would like you to tell us about the moment when you decided to declare the moratorium. Um, from the book, I understand that there was a preceding phone call with the Illinois Attorney General. And so can you please tell us about that moment? The moment when uh, the Attorney General called? And the moment when you decided that you were going to, uh, when you were going to establish the moratorium. Well, yeah, that, I had to wait a while and uh, there, there were a couple people in the pipeline to be executed when I called the moratorium. I don't, I don't know how many, I don't remember now, there was several. And uh, it, it, it aggravated every prosecutor in all 102 counties in Illinois, uh, along with the Attorney General of the state, uh, that we weren't following up, I wasn't signing the execution orders. And uh, I figured that was the only way I could get what I needed to get done, was to improve and, and uh, make the death penalty at least, hopefully, uh, less likely to kill an innocent person. And so uh, that's, that's uh, what we were doing at the time. When, when he called to ask me, he said he had some more people that he was going to send over to me, but uh, I was going to have to start signing the uh, execution notices. So that uh, kind of forced my hand into saying, well, I'm, I'm not going to sign them until that I can be sure with some moral certainty that... Uh, that these people were going to be innocent and that's basically what it was all about so that's why i called the moratorium and uh, stopped all executions in the state in your book i read a story about um a person who was executed under your watch his name was uh ando andrew uh Co Cocorales, is that right? Andrew Cocorales, yeah. He was a great Cocorales. Guy. I mean, he was a convicted serial killer, but in your book, I noticed that it seemed that you really agonized over that. Can you tell well, us about I that? I agonized over any, anybody that, uh, that you, you have to kill. Somebody says, uh, you know, uh, we're going to put you in a chair and shoot you full of poison, and you're the guy that's responsible. You're the, that fellow that has to make it happen. Uh, I... Uh, I've been a pharmacist by trade, and practiced all my life uh, uh, to, to take care of people and not kill them. And uh, I uh, just didn't want to sign that. I was really, uh, there was really not a whole lot of doubt in my mind, but, but there was a little. You know, there were a lot of people that were after me to, to uh, not execute uh, Andrew Corky Alice. And I think a lot, a lot of people don't understand that. I had the, the church was all over me, the Greek church, the archbishop from the church was, uh, was after me every day and every night uh, to not sign the, uh, the order. And of course, uh, there were all of the, the anti-death penalty uh, people that were the, in the same boat. So I heard from all of them and I had a lot of pressure on me not to do that. But uh, he was a pretty bad guy and he did a lot of bad things. Uh, but but I still had to be the guy that signed the death warrant, and I didn't think that was really proper for me to be doing that. If I didn't have to kill somebody, I sure didn't want to. To what extent was um, were your religious beliefs involved in this? Art, what was what? To what extent were your religious beliefs involved in your decision to um, establish the moratorium? Well, I, I'm not sure that I understand what you're saying. Oh, the, well, let me give you, let me give you a framework for this. Well, um, well, I, okay. I understand that on the night you declared the moratorium that the lights in the Colosseum in Rome were turned on. Yes, and, that, and that yeah. is a practice that is reserved when someone is exonerated or uh, has a sentence commuted. 
So what did that mean to you? Well, it was, I, mean, I, I didn't know it until somebody told me about it and I read about it and they, they, I mean, they didn't send me a letter and say, we're going to light the Coliseum for you. Uh, they just did it. And I think they did it on uh, three occasions or two occasions, more than once. And, and I know they did it once when I was there. You know, I traveled all of Europe uh, where they don't have any death penalties in uh, any of the European countries uh, to, to back get some support with a group called Hands Off Cain, uh, an death, anti-death penalty organization there. And um, I traveled to every uh, place around to see if, if we couldn't get the death to get support to get the United States to drop the death penalty. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, they liked the auditorium. They did it, I think, three times for me, twice. I'm not sure. Tell us about um, tell us about your relationships with the victims' families. Losing your I, sound there. Yeah, your sound went down. Okay, uh, tell me about your relationship with your victims' families. With what? With victims the victims' families. families. Oh, that was tough. You know, that was the toughest part. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I, well, the, the, that was probably one of the toughest things I had to do was sit down and talk to people and listen to their stories about what they'd lost. They'd have pictures of their loved ones. Uh, and uh, get, I mean, you know, it, it, it's a terrible thing to go through to have a daughter killed or raped and murdered and shot, throat slit. Uh, it's just a terrible thing. But it, but uh, and, and they, they all claim that they, they get closure if they're going to have another execution. I never quite understood that. And of course, they always ask me uh, about my personal feelings. And the question always was, uh, you got five daughters. And uh, how would you feel if uh, this happened to your daughter? I said, I hope I never find out. Uh, because they just don't know as I could answer that question right now, what I'd think about it. But uh, I can't believe that the execution of another person uh, could give you a lot of relief and make it go away. It's going to be something that you're going to live with. I would guess whether the person is alive or whether he's dead. And then uh, I don't know if you'd get a whole lot of joy, but maybe you would, out of sitting in a chamber watching uh, this person get executed. Kind of barbaric, I would think. But, uh, but they, were, uh, they were, I mean, they were, I still get nasty letters from people. Uh, anonymously, of course, uh, about the uh, whole situation, and they have they have a lot of bad feelings with the victims' families, and and I understand it. I, I guess you know, uh, I'm in a house that uh, right across the alley from my house here in, in Kankakee is a, is the grandson of another governor of Illinois. His name was Len Small. He was governor back in 1926, and uh, he. Uh, made a lot of money in those days and became very wealthy and left the family a lot of money. And the, my neighbor bought the house uh, that they lived in and a young man inherited a lot of, of the money and bought a lot of fancy cars. And in Kankakee, you know, a, a Maserati or whatever they call those cars, it stands out like, a, you know, not like it would in Hollywood, uh, certainly, but, uh, and he bought an old Frank Lloyd Wright house in Kankakee and was remodeling it. He went to Europe and got the glass and the stain the windows and re preserved the house and put it back into shape. And he had a young man that worked as an electrician. And one day he pulled into the driveway of this house and this kid was up in a high in the ceiling and he looked down and he saw this car and said, who's that? And they said, well, that's Steve Small. And he's got a lot of money. Well, this kid plots to kidnap Steve. So uh, he calls him one night at midnight and says, uh, we're the Chicago Key Police. And we've just arrested some people that have been, uh, that have been broken into your house over here. And you better come and sign some papers to get him put in jail. So he told his wife about midnight, I got to go over and sign these papers. I'll be back. He walked down, got opened his garage door. They threw a gun on him and put him in the trunk of the car and drove him out into a, an area where the, the ground is all sandy and soft. They had a grave already dug. In. They had a coffin that they made in a garage and they threw him in it and called, the, before they did that, they made him call his wife and tell her uh, to get a million dollars put together and not to say anything to her or to call the police, but you get a hold of the banker and get the money. 
So she, of course, called the police right away and the FBI, and they came and they and searched. But it, the long story short, uh, they caught the guy a couple of days later. But they, of course, uh, it was too late because he died within <clears throat> a short period of time. He was asphyxiated, didn't have any air in the hole, and and uh, so he went to jail. <clears throat> and uh, that was a, a story that. that uh, uh, I felt bad about because I really kind of lost their friendship. I think they're back now after several years as, as halfway friends, but they never understood why I didn't want to execute his, uh, his killer. And, and I didn't. And that's a whole other story uh, uh, about what happened there. But uh, he, uh, he, is, he is in prison uh, still. Uh, and, and he was on death row. And he asked that I leave him on death row. Death row. Uh, because he wanted to take his chance with the feds uh, communicating his sentence in some fashion. But uh, that was one of the things uh, that was pretty, that I really didn't like about, the, about what I had to do there. Uh, but uh, I had to do it. I, I, had to, I really thought that it would, it would be a boost to, to, to doing what we're trying to do, and that's to avoid the death penalty. Thank you for that. It seems like it takes a lot of leadership to do those Nancy, that are difficult. again, you, some, something's wrong with your sound. Yeah, I can't hear it. Let's just try it again. Okay, are we any better now? A little better. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and I will we'll work on that. Um, it seems to me that it takes a lot of uh, courage and a lot of leadership to make a decision that people do not uniformly agree with. So, and I wanted to mention in 2002, uh, Mike Farrell was in a play called The Exonerated. And let me share a screen with you here. Uh, here we go. This is the review here from the Washington Post. From the Washington Post, January 13, 2003. And it talks about the play The Exonerated. And The Exonerated uh, was an off Broadway play based on the real life experience of five American men and women who were condemned to death and eventually had their convictions overturned. Um, Mike has a unique experience and part in this. Uh, the story goes on, talks about more about the play, and it said last month, Richard Dreyfus, Glover, and Mike Farrell traveled to Chicago and performed the play at the invitation of outgoing Governor George Ryan, who imposed a moratorium on executions. And that Saturday, Ryan commuted the sentences of everyone on the state's death row to life in prison. In the crowd, there were 40 people from around the country who had been sentenced to death and set free after their convictions were reversed. So Mike, I wanted to ask you about your experience in that time and the political climate, uh, the political climate for the moratorium and about the death penalty back then. Back then, well, back then goes back a ways. Um, are you hearing me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, better. <laughs> okay. The, uh, well, it, it, we, most of us know that the death penalty was uh, uh, stopped by the Supreme Court in 72 and not reinstated until 1976 when we consider the modern era of the death penalty to have begun. Um, and in uh, about that time, I, w I was asked by a minister uh, in the in Nashville, Tennessee, to, to get involved with him in trying to stop the death penalty. And it, it became a kind of calling, I must say. Um, and I was all over the country um, working to stop executions, doing what I could. But it, it was, we were, much of what we were doing was falling on deaf ears. There was, a, there was a, certainly a, 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 a big wall of support for the death penalty. The death penalty was thought to be necessary and appropriate, and it was solving all the problems of, as the governor has suggested, that people thought it was gonna solve the murder victims' family members, uh, thought that it was gonna solve their problems, except for an organization called Murder Victims' Family uh, Members for Reconciliation. 
Um, and um, I, I worked with them and a number of other groups that uh, came up out in support of uh, stopping the use of the death penalty because we all felt that it was morally wrong and heart hurtful and hideously expensive and racist and all the things that it has been uh, finally understood to be or is <laughs> finally not known to be. Um, and <clears throat> one of the states uh, I got involved in was uh, Illinois with a case uh, the governor will be familiar with, uh, Gwen Garcia, uh, Governor uh, Edgar, I believe it was, we finally persuaded to, uh, to uh, commute her to life rather than to right. kill her, as she had asked to actually supported the idea of her own be herself being executed because her life experience was so horrific. But um, the, the work against the death penalty was really an uphill climb. We, we used to talk a death penalty focus about meetings being in a, could be in a phone booth because no, nobody wanted to uh, be associated with the idea that uh, you were opposed to the death penalty. And little by little by little, we began to get more, I guess, um, uh, acceptance, at least in the, in the sense of having people recognize that there was an issue that could be discussed. Um, and in 1998, um, Larry Marshall uh, contacted us and um, Death Valley Focus co-sponsored the, um, uh, the, uh, Larry set up an organization called, what was it, Governor? Uh, the uh, Wrongful Convictions. Wrongful Convictions. Yeah. Center on Wrongful Convictions. Center on Wrongful Convictions. Convictions. Thanks, Maurice. Um, and we, so he put together, Larry put this whole thing together. I was there, but uh, just a, uh, a happy participant. Um, 37, I think, of the then 70 some known uh, exonerees of people who had been tried, convicted, sentenced to death, and ultimately, rather than being executed, um, were exonerated, found to be innocent and exonerated, um, came and s stood up on stage one at a time and said, if the governor, if, if, if the state of Florida had had its way, I would be dead today. If the state of California had had its way, if the state of Texas had, they, they, and it was really a quite extraordinary development um, at that point because the idea of death penalty was um, making mistakes was really not well known. And this, um, this event put together by Larry Marshall really brought the world's press to the, into Chicago to the extent of uh, photographing and talking about and interviewing people. Uh, that's why I met Brian Stevenson, so many people who became great leaders in the, in the movement. Uh, Sister Helen Prejean was uh, involved uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, and um, Larry had this idea that uh, there was, there, there was the, the, the situation in Illinois was such that it was ripe for overturning, but it involved educating people. It involved uh, a lot of kind of getting attention to the issues. Um, and one of the things that happened was at that point, as you suggested, there was a, um, an off-Broadway play being done. Uh, and a lot of actors, well-known actors, were coming in on a daily basis to do one of the, one of the roles. So I'm not sure if it, I, I'm sure Larry was, was in, instrumental in getting it there. Uh, I know the author of the play came um, and put it on. They asked me if I would do it. Danny Glover did it. Richard Dreyfuss did it. And a, a number of the local actors joined us. And the governor, as I understood it at the time, and we weren't sure, but the governor's office was involved somehow in, uh, in um, being uh, uh, instrumental in having this thing put on. But the idea was to kind of move the governor. I guess the moratorium had already been established by that point. Right. Um, I, I, I should back up just a minute. When we were working to try and uh, uh, facilitate any kind of effort we could get, the governor did what you've been talking about. He studied the issue, uh, I think very courageously and extraordinarily in great detail and finally made the determination to, uh, to declare a moratorium because 
more people had been exonerated from Illinois' death row than had been executed. And it was, a, it was really a blight on the state, I think. Uh, and the governor thought that was wrong and something should be done about it. I took the uh, sort of <laughs> um, brazen approach and I called uh, when I heard the day he had made the decision public. I called the governor's office to just simply lend my support. Um, and the operator that c got my call, I said, I'm calling to just to pass on word to Governor uh, Ryan how much I appreciate what he's done. And I think it's a courageous, courageously uh, heroic thing. And she said, hold on a minute. And <laughs> phone rang. and. A fellow picked up the phone and I said, I'm calling for the governor. He said, this is Governor Ryan. <laughs> and I said, I was sort of stunned by talking to the governor himself. And I said, Governor, I, I, I'm, my name is Mike Farrell and I'm uh, an abolitionist. And I'm calling to say thank you for what you've done. I think it's quite courageous and <laughs> heroic. And we talked for a while and he, uh, he invited me back to, uh, to meet and talk. And I was then back and forth to Chicago a number of times. We had dinner together a few times with uh, your, your wife. I'm so, so sorry to hear about the passing of Laura Lynn, I want to say. And um, we were, uh, I, I, Gov Governor Ryan said, you know, I'm, an, I'm a, as I recall, I'm saying I'm a sort of a meat and potatoes conservative Republican. I'm not sure why <laughs> I'm doing this thing this but it just seems to me to be the right thing to do and i said well god bless you that's if more people were doing what they thought to be the right thing we would be in much far better shape in this country so the uh, i think the purpose of the uh, uh the the exonerated and the campaign we kept promoting um for the governor was in hopes that he would um end the death penalty that uh, as a result of the work of the commission that uh, he said established a commission that was well balanced, uh, I think 15 people, seven of whom on each, seven of whom were pro death penalty and seven of whom were opposed to the death penalty. And they looked at the uh, state of the death penalty in uh, Illinois at the time and made their findings known. And unofficially, I, I, my understanding was they didn't have a, a chart, a, a, a brief to make a declaration one way or the other, but I'm not sure, so I'm not sure how it happened, but it became clear that um, they said that, uh, or many of them said that the death penalty should be ended. Um, and f however it happened, I will never forget the day I, I got the call to come from the governor's office to come to uh, Chicago. He was going to make a statement and the statement was, and we were all sitting with bated breath there in the in the, uh, the big room. I forgot where it was. Uh, Lincoln oh, Hall. Right. I'm sorry, what? Lincoln Hall. Oh, Lincoln what? Hall. I want to say Lincoln, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, Lincoln Hall. And um, he made the declaration that he was uh, he was declaring um, a, a general, not a pardon, a general uh, commutation, and uh, releasing. Um, I think it was four men from death row and commuting the others to life. And it was, it was a, forgive me, a, a, an extraordinarily, a boon for those of us in the abolition movement. It was a red letter day for me and for so many others. And, and certainly for the hundred and, what was it? 56, 167. 100 and 167. 167. Men. Uh, all, I think, men at that point on death row. And um, we subsequently, uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that, D DPF, Death Penalty Focus, brought the governor out and to California. We gave him, we awarded him, we uh, honored him twice, actually. Right. For his, uh, for his work uh, and for his extraordinary courage in the face of um, a colossal wave of opposition to his action. Uh, but it was, to me, it was one of the great demonstrations of political courage in, in the United States ever. I understand that that was your, the first national award you'd received, Governor Ryan, for your uh, moratorium of the death penalty. 
You, you understand it when you do it. At the death penalty focus award that you received. Right, it was, yes, it was. Thanks, Mike, by the way, for your, for your kind words. I appreciate that. <clears throat> well, you're a hero, Governor. Have been um, and continue to be. Indeed. Uh, thank you. Indeed. I don't wear a cape. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to, obviously. <laughs> So, and so Maurice, uh, Maurice Posley is a three-time Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and um, the author of three and now four books. Um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Actually five. I, you um, were, I, I, will, oh, I will make one correction. I okay. only won the Pulitzer once, but I was nominated other times, so. In our hearts, we feel like you should have won. Uh, so uh, anyhow, you were a journalist in, in Chicago during Governor Ryan's tenure there. Can, from your outside perspective, tell me, tell us what the uh, environment was uh, as far as the death penalty and whether that was even an issue or not. Well, the, the issue of, of, the flaws in the criminal justice system was something that the Chicago Tribune began putting under the microscope in 1999. Literally the day he was sworn in, the Tribune published a series, the beginning of a series uh, called Trial and Error. And it was about prosecutorial misconduct nationally in Cook County and in murder cases um, and in death penalty cases. And, you know, when, when George and I got together and to put together the, his book, um, we talked about sort of his education um, on the criminal justice system. And uh, it began to some extent with what the media was doing in writing about systemic problems as well as individual exonerations. And really, he was sworn in and we publish a series to talk about the flaws and uh, the misconduct of prosecutors, especially in death penalty cases. And then a month later, Anthony Porter walks off a death row following uh, an investigation I mean, uh, there were lawyers involved, but Northwestern University journalism students under Dave Protus, a professor there, basically got the real killer to confess. And it was an astounding uh, moment. I mean, we'd had exonerations in Illinois, but nothing that was sort of cataclysmic uh, like this one was. This was a guy, Anthony Porter, who had been, um, who was so close to his execution that his family had buried the suit, had bought the suit to bury him in. Mm -hmm. um, and he had gotten a stay um, on the basis of a, a request from his lawyers that there be a hearing on whether he was mentally competent to be executed. I mean, this is one of the crazy things about the, you know, this, this entire system um, is, you know, ideally they want people to appreciate the fact that they're being executed for a reason. And if you're not mentally competent, you don't understand you're, what you're doing. It's sort of like, what's the point in the first place, but particularly what's the point here? You know, um, there's the famous case where um, I'm trying to remember what state it was, but Bill Clinton came back off the campaign trail to approve the, well, it would have been his state. Uh, Ricky, Ray Rector. The, uh, Ricky Ray Rector. Rector, who when they asked him uh, after when he had his last meal and he didn't eat his pie and they asked him and he said, I'm saving that for later. And this was a guy who had been shot in the head and killed a police officer or maybe two, but um, really didn't understand what the heck was going on. And it just, there are these examples. So this was Anthony Porter's got the stay. And in the time that he got the stay, some journalism students went up to Milwaukee and got a confession on video uh, of the real killer. And so um, that series that the Tribune uh, wrote 
it was an enlightened time uh, at the Chicago Tribune, launched what was what became a series of series. Um, St uh, Ken Armstrong and I worked on the prosecutorial misconduct series, and then Ken Armstrong and Steve Mills did a series on the death penalty in Illinois that came out in December, November, excuse me, of 99. And th this exposed just how flawed the Illinois system was. And it didn't have to be based on the uh, cases of exoneration. It just showed how flawed it was and how many cases that kept getting reversed and, and people wind up then having to have all new trials, all new death penalty hearings, um, people being represented on death penalty cases by the same person who wrote the family's will, um, that sort of thing, snitches uh, being used to convict people. Uh, the uh, torture cases where people were being tortured by detectives to, to confess. And, and, you know, the four people that Mike referred to that Governor Ryan pardoned, um, Aaron Patterson and Stanley Howard and Leroy Orange and um, I thought I was going to remember these, but, um, yeah. and I'll, I'll remember the other one in a second, but um, they were all torture victims and he pardoned them on the basis of actual innocence. Um, the, the, uh, the press, I think, played a, a huge role in the sense that um, you can take a deeper dive into some of these issues we did. Um, and it wasn't sort of the politics being argued. Um, when you say we've looked at 30 years of murder cases and found 400 of them being reversed because prosecutors um, failed to reveal evidence of a person's innocence or knowingly used false evidence. You didn't cherry pick a couple of examples to make a point. It was, we looked at all the cases over 30 years. And so that's what they did with the death penalty case. They looked at all 285 cases in Illinois. Um, and I think that was very powerful. And over the ensuing years, there was a lot of coverage in the Tribune, some of it that I was involved in, Steve Mills and Ken Armstrong, about the uh, other exonerations and what was going on across the country. Um, really, this is my perspective, is that the, as a, the debate was powerfully shifted from, is it morally right for the state to kill people to deter others from killing people to how can we trust this system to kill the right people? Can it be trusted? Can it ever be trusted? Can it be fixed? Um, and I think that, that you could call up any politician and say, how do you feel about killing innocent people? Nobody's, you know, that was sort of the tenor of things. And in declaring the moratorium, putting a stamp on, I can't trust this system. And that's really where the title of the book comes from. He said, until I can be sure, um, it's not going to happen. Not on my watch. And so when we were talking about um, what should we call the book, I first thought, well, until I can be sure, because that's what he said. Well, it's a memoir, so it should be until I could be sure. <laughs> and so that made perfect sense. Um, I think that, you know, his staff, um, members of his staff, and, and people like uh, Larry Marshall and Rob Warden at Northwestern um, made sure that um, the reporting that was going on that exposed these flaws was something that um, uh, George was aware of, not only was aware of, was being educated by. Um, and, you know, in talking to people uh, for research for the book, um, one of the things that became very clear is every time George would read some of these things, he would say, how does this happen? How can this ha happen? And I think that's a real um, honest and uh, true reaction that anyone who studies this would have. 
Um, how do these things happen? And, you know, my real job these days is as a researcher for the National Registry of Exonerations, which is a database of now almost 2,700 wrongful convictions in the United States since 1989. And we add about 200 cases a year to this database. And I look at these and I see these people getting exonerated and you look at the cases and you say, how did this person get convicted in the first place? It's just, you know, and you see junk science, jailhouse snitches, um, lying police officers, corrupt prosecutors, um, you know, uh, there was a prosecutor in uh, Texas. We did some work on wrongful executions in Texas while we we're at the Tribune, who said, quoted a uh, philosopher that said, you know, out of the crooked timber of life, nothing was ever made perfect by a human being. Um, I'm, that's a bad, probably, paraphrase of that quote, but it's really true. And I think that the really the reporting that went on at that time played a huge role in educating um, the governor and as well as, as people that maybe didn't have a, a stance. You know, a lot of people would say, I never really thought about whether I should be for it or against it. I just thought it was part of the institution, the fabric of, yeah. of what we have as a government. Um, and then they would say, but I'd started to read this and started learning this. And then as the, you know, as Mike mentioned, you know, at the point where you've got more people being exonerated than being executed, it's, you know, what's the point of this system? As, as the governor would say, it's no better than flipping a coin. Um, so, um, I'll, I'll stop now, but uh, I could go on for a long time about, you know, there were studies that came out, the Jim Liebman's study at Columbia uh, came out about that time um, that, that looked at death penalty cases across the country for since the modern day. Um, I'll just say this, in working with George on this memoir, it was uh, really fascinating to hear him talk about his education of this and through people like you, Mike, and Larry Marshall and, and others. Um, and I think he's, will say, he was just sort of shocked at the uh, reaction and being embraced by, you know, people such as yourself and others, that it was not something that, you know, and I think it really shows that what he did came of his heart and not for any particular motivation, but it was for the right, it was because it was the right thing to do. Let me ask this question. In your book, one of the things I found- I'm having a hard time hearing you there. I'm sorry. In your book, Governor, one of the things that I um, was surprised by was the fact that I think at some point there had been 12 executions and 13 exonerations. Yeah. That's right. That's just an astounding and terrifying number. I mean, do, do we have any reason to believe that things have improved? Yeah, there's no death penalty. Oh, right. <laughs> right. But At least yes, in Illinois. Right. Yeah. I mean, in the general landscape, uh, judicial landscape, is there any reason to think that things have improved over those numbers? Well, right? I guess we'll never know because we can't convict anybody now of the death penalty in Illinois. But, but we got, I think, 20, what is it, 28 states in the federal government that still has the death penalty. Uh, and, and I'm sure that, you know, that they, they, they've got those problems that I was concerned about. They're still still there. I, uh, I, yeah, I'm, those kind of things. I'm, I'm optimistic in certain areas about the criminal justice system. Uh, I think that there's, there's a, a, a lot of room for improvement, but I think that, that um, we've seen improvements in the area of uh, how police conduct lineups. Um, we've seen, I think, improvement in forensic science, although you still... I mean, face it, the criminal justice system is a state system that we're talking about. 
there is a federal system, but we're largely talking about a state system. And we're talking about almost 3000 counties in this country. And every one is its own little fiefdom. Um, some yeah. have millions of people and some have not so many people, but you can't, it's hard to initiate change. You can maybe in, initiate change a state system that goes throughout. Uh, you know, back when uh, Barack Obama was still uh, an Illinois legislator, he was part of a group that um, got the first law passed about recording interrogations uh, in homicide cases. Um, that's another improvement, not just to record a final statement, but to record the actual interrogation. All the interrupt you for a minute, uh, uh, Maurice. That came out of the, you're talking about the, taping the confessions. Is that what you're talking about? That came that out came of your out commission. Of he handled the bill, I think, in the Senate. For Correct. It. Right. Correct. And, uh, but uh, yeah, that was just one of the things. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I did. No, no, it's okay. I, you know, I hate to interrupt the governor. But... Your, 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 critical point, your critical point there is that it was the uh, taping of the interrogation. As well. Right. That's the only thing that we got passed in the assembly was the fact that we got to the, the, the law passed that said they had to interrogate, you had to tape uh, confessions. It's right. the only thing out of the 50 some or 80 some recommendations that the commission made. It was an election year. I had a president of the Senate who was just drove me nuts for four years while I was governor and he was a Republican, but uh, uh, he did, there was no, he was just an anti, I mean, a pro death penalty guy. And he would have hung his mother, I think. He was, um, he was, um, yeah, Laura, the, Laura, let me ask you, um, to what, what effect has Governor Ryan's moratorium had on the landscape of uh, the death penalty in the United States? Thanks, Nancy. Uh, well, that is obviously, it's a, it's a broad question, but I'll try to address some parts of it because I got to think about it a little bit before, before we did this. Um, so one thing that I wanted to to focus in on that I think is just so essential to, to keep in mind is that even though there had been acts of clemency by governors or by executives in the past, it's not something that's totally foreign in the 20th century in American politics, but it was something that especially in as the, the 80s and the 90s and sort of coming up on when Governor Ryan was in office in Illinois was something that really was dwindling. I mean, to call the clemency power sort of anemic, especially in the context of death penalty cases would not be, that would not be mistaken. I think that was something that had not been in insignificant use, hadn't been taken seriously. And for a number of reasons, then people who were doing death penalty work, the death penalty attorneys, um, activists, abolitionists, you know, the clemency power was something to, to think about, but it wasn't necessarily where you needed to, where you needed to focus because it didn't seem as though it was going to be your best bet at actually stopping an execution or saving someone's life. And I think the fact that what Governor Ryan did in Illinois was, and, and this has been mentioned by other panelists, but by taking such an incredibly considered approach to thinking through the issue of capital punishment in Illinois to saying, okay, there are things now that as governor, I feel like it's my responsibility to, to understand better, to, to look into further these cases that are coming out of exonerations of wrongful convictions that are signaling there's obviously something wrong in the system. I need to have, as the, the executive of the state of Illinois, I need to have confidence that the laws are being, being executed faithfully and well, and to actually look at the clemency process and to bring it into such focus for the public, I think has made a huge difference in how we've been thinking now about clemency and death penalty cases these last, uh, these last couple of decades. And one thing that I think came out of this is that because it wasn't sort of a sudden, it wasn't a sudden process, right? It wasn't a sudden grant of mass commutations. It was thinking, okay, I'm going to declare a moratorium because we have this incredible statistic of more exonerations than we have executions. Something is troubling. We need to convene experts to look into this. It was in the press, it was in the media, it was something that was getting discussed over a period of time. And that was also reminding people, wait a second, this clemency power exists. <laughs> this clemency power has been built into every state that has the death penalty. Every US state has a provision, and this is what we were just talking about, that what Maurice was talking about, that we're talking about fiefdoms, right? We're talking about a state-by-state -state process. This is not about 
necessarily convincing a majority of all U.S. citizens. This is about affecting change on a very localized, specific level because that's where that's where death penalty cases come out of. And in fact, that's where the clemency powers are found. The clemency powers are found in the individual states. There's no federal constitutional right to clemency, right? It's not something that's in our federal U.S. Constitution. It's something that every single state that has the death penalty has a clemency power uh, in, in some way defined either in the state constitution um, or by state statute. And so this was something that we started, I think people started thinking about more seriously as Governor Ryan was talking about using this power and was in effect, was actually using this power in Illinois. Okay, what is the basis for this authority? And there were critiques that I was seeing um, when I was when I was reading the book and just sort of knowing about how these discussions go, you know, it, it causes a lot of people to, a lot of critics of, this way of, of using the clemency power would say, you know, this is unlawful or this is overriding the jury opinion or this is not respecting what, what the laws command us to do. And what this sort of forces us to think about was that actually clemency is a part of our criminal justice system. It's a part of the law. And not only is it a part of the law, it's a part of the law that even the framers of, you know, back Alexander Hamilton and even further back, that was so integral to have as every part, as every, as part of every state's criminal justice system, that laws can be universally applied, but that doesn't mean that the outcome is always going to be just. And so it's essential that we have the possibility for clemency built into our criminal justice system. So in fact, this is a really integral part of how we do justice in this country. And I think it sort of fell out of a favor for a while when we had sort of the more tough on crime policies, when crime rates were high, when death sentences and executions were high. And I think Governor Ryan's actions really started a bit of a reset um, that we are seeing continuing now in these, last, in these last couple of decades as we start to evolve our thinking also, as Maurice was saying, we're starting to evolve our thinking on criminal justice, but I think focusing this issue of, okay, what is this power, how do we use it, and why is it there, was just incredibly, incredibly important for all of us in thinking about clemency. Um, and one thing I just want to quickly see if I can do while I have the, the screen. Um, so at the American Bar Association, I, here we go, um, I work specifically for the last five years, I've been working on uh, clemency and death penalty cases because this was an area that in 2015 the ABA thought, okay, this is an important aspect of death penalty cases, but there's just not enough information out there. And this goes back to what we were talking about, that it's very state by state how the clemency power works. So we've been working for years now on this website, capitalclemency.org, which goes through, we don't have all the death penalty states, but we have several. <laughs> um, and it goes through in very explicit detail how the clemency process in every specific every specific uh, state works, particularly death penalty states. And what I think is critical for people to, to think about here is that also we tend to think that, okay, clemency is always the same. The executive has the power, can commute all sentences. But in fact, that's not true. Some states make it a lot more difficult and some of the most um, aggressive death penalty states make it more difficult. So for example, in Texas, you don't have the same power that Governor Ryan had in Illinois. In Texas, you need the recommendation of the parole board. Um, you need a majority recommendation of the parole board in order for a commutation to be granted. The only power that the governor has independently is to grant one 30-day reprieve. And this is the same in Oklahoma. And in Oklahoma, you need the recommendation of a majority of the parole board in order to grant clemency in a death penalty case. In Florida, you need not only the recommendation of a majority of the Board of Executive Clemency, which is the governor and the, the four cabinet members, but the governor also then has veto power. <laughs> so there's a lot of, so all of this is to say that we're starting to work on how clemency works in the individual states to see where it's different than what it was, for example, in Illinois, where the power is more constrained, what this tells us about how we can use it and how we can maybe make recommendations for change. Um, but this was, this was all to say that I think there's no understating how significant the actions Governor Ryan took in Illinois have been to our consideration of new ways of understanding the clemency power and death penalty cases. I think they really reinvigorated this research and reinvigorated us as lawyers, attorneys who work on the, the capital defense bar 
to really think about how do we how do we make sure that this is also something that attorneys are taking more seriously because this is a real power that has the potential to save clients lives you know if I, I could, oh, if I could just add um, to that in the registry we have about a hundred people who have been exonerated who were originally sentenced to death and some of them were still on death row when they were exonerated um, Curtis Flowers is an example of one um, who just officially got exonerated that the case was dismissed he will not have a seventh trial um, but uh, probably, and I haven't looked, but uh, about half of those in the registry were people who were alive to be exonerated because they got new sentencing hearings and they got resentenced to life. Um, and the chances of them having, I mean, you can't really know um, because the system is so um, procedurally weird um, despite the best efforts of people to try to speed it up so we, they can get killed faster. Um, there's, I think it's without question that some of those people would have been executed had they not had their sentences um, commuted to, to life and they were alive to be exonerated. Um, so, I mean, the, I think the whole issue of clemency and, and looking at you know, the death penalty cases obviously get a lot of attention because there is a, um, a finality here as opposed to, you know, life without parole while well, you're going to die here um, someday of, of, of something. Um, but the, the, I think it's really important to, to those efforts for clemency is, is extraordinarily powerful too. And I just add, your, your, the definition was interesting to me. It's an act of grace. There's precious little grace visible today in political circles. It's, uh, it's become a war. And uh, the, to, to some degree, the uh, Darwinian code seems to apply. Um, I hunger for the time when we have leaders with the, the courage, the heart, and the integrity of Governor Ryan who did what he did and I think established um, himself, but also established a, uh, a, a level at which um, we can require and request that uh, chief executives of our various states demand of themselves. Well, Mike, thanks very much for those kind words. You know, it, it really was a no brainer, frankly. <laughs> for you. It was, yeah, well, it wasn't. It, it, You've got a system that just doesn't work. I, I, I likened it to uh, flying an airplane from Chicago to Los Angeles, and it crashes uh, three days a week. Are you going <laughs> to fix it, or are you going to keep flying the airplane? Uh, I decided, but maybe we better fix it, and we and we did fix it if we could have passed some of that legislation. Uh, but it was just it was brutal. It was an election year, and it, it just never happened. And I, I really feel bad that we never got it done. And maybe someday that'll happen. But at least we got them stopped in Illinois. You did. You did. And you well, did. May I ask a question from the audience here? Um, yeah. This came quite a bit ago. And uh, let's see. Who is it? I'm looking over here. A number of, a number of people spoke up. From Sandra Joy, she says, um, she said that, uh, Maurice made the comment that Governor Ryan said that the death penalty wasn't killing the right people, in quotes. So the question, do you feel that way? And do you feel like there are any right people, Governor Ryan, to be executed? I, never, I don't believe I ever made that statement. I think I it was did. Maurice who made this. Or statement. maybe I said it in a different way, but I don't think so. Uh, well, I think what I, I think what I was trying to say is that the system couldn't be trusted to not kill an innocent person. And well, you the system is just terrible. I mean, it had all kinds of problems, and still does in, in, in other states. You can, there's no way you can pass a death penalty law and have it perfect. And if you're going to kill somebody, you better have a law that's perfect. But I can't say we're going to kill the right people. Let me ask another question too. Um, it, 
it seems we're told that the majority of the public see life without the possibility of parole as a preferable sentence for murder than the death penalty. My question is, how do we get the silent majority to speak up for abolition? Well, I don't know. <clears throat> it's, uh, I mean, there's been certainly a lot of attention brought to all of these things, uh, the heirs that are there. But, but, you know, it's like I said, when I first got into the business of running for public office, uh, the death penalty was never an issue. I mean, it was on questionnaires that you filled out and you'd mark it, uh, yes, you're against the death penalty. But you never, never, I never heard it in any debates or any, any uh, programs that I was involved in. Nobody ever put, put the, um, the question to me in a, in a hard fashion. So I think uh, that that's the, oh, I'm sorry, George. That's right. Go ahead. I think that um, one of the ways that it's gotten some traction with uh, the, the audience that you're talking about Nancy is the money, um, the, the cost, the enormous cost. Um, and certainly it's been used by some states as a justification um, for getting rid of it. Um, and I think that there's a political, that gives a political out in a way. So you don't have to frontally address the issue of killing people um, as a form of punishment. And you can, the, the, although, you know, what we've seen over the years with litigation for, from wrongful convictions and police brutality and, you know, prosecutors have immunity, uh, police have qualified immunity. Um, and yet there's millions and tens of hundreds of millions I think um, Jeff Gutman, a professor at GW Law School, has done a study, and it's a, a, it's more than a billion dollars that's been paid out just to the wrongfully convicted, and many of them didn't get any money. The taxpayer issue, the the burden on their pocket, doesn't get as much traction as I think it should, but I think it does get some traction after a while. Um, and, and you talk about um, what it costs to house people on death row and what it costs to litigate these cases. And it's, it's tens and tens of millions of dollars across this country that to, to what, have a system in California that's executed, what, 13 people? Um, right. And has now the, the largest, well, I mean, thank you, Governor Newsom for the moratorium, but has the largest death row at that point uh, in the country. Um, of course, the reason Texas didn't have one is because they killed them. Yeah, uh, you bet. Right. So, um, I do think the money makes a, is something that has attraction. I mean, a but question you know here. Else, Go ahead, Governor. What I, what I think else is, you got to, is a generational change. You know, people my age, were, were, I was always brought up that the death penalty is needed, it's good, it takes care of the bad guys, puts them in jail, it's a deterrent. Young people today don't believe that. And I think that eventually they're going to be the ones that are going to make, uh, make the major changes in the death penalty laws. Well, and, I, and, and abolish it, frankly. And here's a question that I think we saw in a previous webinar. It's from Tony Alfino out of um, San Diego. He says, um, have any prosecutors or police who acted in bad faith in these death penalty cases um, been taken to task in any meaningful way? That's a good question. And prosecutorial immunity is a big problem in our system because basically it says just that. If a prosecutor can no matter what she or he does, if the prosecutor can maintain that it was doing, he or she was doing it in pursuit of the proper forms and proper procedures in, uh, under his or her uh, authority, then there, there is immunity of any kind of prosecution. So it's very rare that we get that kind of... Uh, it's extremely rare. That, and it, just today, the registry has issued a, a report on official misconduct in wrongful convictions that talks about police misconduct and prosecutor misconduct in the first 2,400 exonerations in the registry. And the short answer is hardly anyone ever is 
disciplined in any way, in any case, let alone death penalty cases. One of the rare cases that most of you are familiar with probably is uh, Michael Morton case, which wasn't a death penalty case, but he spent 25 years of a life sentence in, in Texas before he was exonerated. Um, and the exoneration process showed that the real killer had gone on to kill someone else uh, after uh, he killed Michael's wife. And uh, the prosecutor in that case, who like many prosecutors in this country, uh, had become a judge, um, was found to have uh, withheld evidence that pointed to this other suspect. And um, Barry Sheck and the Innocence Project worked very hard. And as a result, um, the judge, Ken Anderson, was charged with contempt, criminal contempt, pled guilty, lost his judgeship, lost his license to practice law, mm -hmm. spent 72 hours in, in jail, which doesn't compare very favorably with 25 years than Michael Morton. But that's one of the rare occasions. Um, it's just the, the whole process of disciplining people for misconduct is in tatters as far as I'm concerned. Well, there's certainly a problem with immunity uh, in every state. In fact, there was a bill that was up here in California. Um, it was initiated by the Senate, by Senator Bradford, uh, went to the assembly and couldn't get enough votes to pass. And it was a bill that had to do with being a having a program to determine when officers, law enforcement officers should have their badge removed. Because a common practice here in California is that you work in one police department and you have a problem there and you just move to the next county and right. take all your problems, you know, and your ill reputation with you. So I have a comment here to read to Governor Ryan and it's from Mark Clements from Chicago. Mark Clements from Chicago says, thank you, Governor, for all the work you've done. Governor, do you think blanket clemency is needed to bring relief to all victims of torture as a result of John Burge and his subordinates? And uh, Mark says, I will end on saying, Governor, we need you as Texas governor. <laughs> as for Mark Clements. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not interested, but thanks. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, John Burge was, was, was a big problem with us in Illinois. Uh, we finally, we finally got him, but, uh, he, he caused a lot of misery for a lot of people. And, uh, that's unfortunately ruined their lives in some cases. Can you tell us about that? Well, he was a police captain on the Chicago police department and he was the enforcer and uh, they needed to get a conviction, uh, you know, as the pressure came from certain murders or certain crimes, uh, John Burge would always uh, find somebody that, that was guilty. And if they had to, to, to tie him up to the radiator and get him burned once in a while or put a gun in their mouth or a bag over their head or whatever they had to do, that's what they did to get a confession. And uh, it finally, it took a long time to, to, to break it, but, uh, we finally got it out. John Burge was convicted and he cost the city millions and millions of dollars in lawsuits that these people provided after they got him. But uh, he died. He went to prison, but he died. Um, there's a question here for Mike. Uh, it's from Steve Rohde, our friend. He says, we appear to be at the tipping point in abolishing the death penalty. What would you encourage people who are watching this webinar, um, who are con convinced the death penalty is wrong, to do in their states and communities to end the death penalty? Well, I think, I think we are on the cusp of a major election. One of the, the uh, uh, issues in which is criminal justice reform. And I think when you couple criminal justice reform with a, with a, uh, a significant uh, look at our racial relationships in this country, you're going to see that the, um, I think people will see that the uh, reforms, part of the reforms that are needed include the simple doing away with the death penalty for the reasons that Maurice just talked about cost but primarily, I think, race and the issues that we've talked about, the, uh, the 
outlawry of the, in so many cases, the uh, prosecutorial ranks. Um, I think we have, uh, I think we have a, a system that is in tatters, as has, has just been suggested. And I think the public uh, is ripe, I'm hoping, for um, some hard work to change these systems. And one of them is going to be, I think, the, uh, the use of the death penalty. And there's a I message- I just add to that. Yes, Nancy please, Laura. Please. Quick, uh, one thing that's sort of been floating around in my mind for the past couple of minutes also is we've been talking about this, and I think it's alluded to a little bit in some of the, the Q&As um, that are coming through, is that there's also an issue where when what you have, I mean, and this goes back to your question about the silent majority on abolishing the death penalty, what a lot of the polls tell us and what a lot of statistics tell us is that if you offer life without parole as an alternative, then support for the death penalty goes under 50% even, right? That's the way, right, that we could potentially get to death penalty abolition. But of course, there's a lot of... <laughs> That, that, that's tricky, right? That's tricky for a lot of death penalty abolitionists. It's tricky for a lot of criminal justice activists to want to push something like life without parole with the goal in mind of abolishing the death penalty, but then falling back on something that even in Governor Ryan's book, he, he describes prisoners who would say, you know, I don't want life without parole. That to me is crueler. That to me is harder than, than a death sentence. But we have a system that has gotten so incredibly cruel <laughs> so used to these incredibly severe punishments, right, that we do see life without the possibility of per, uh, parole as a viable option to, to the death penalty in this country. And maybe there are, maybe that's, that's the way we get to abolition of the death penalty, but then it's a, sort of a question at what cost can we, can we afford not to push for rethinking about the criminal justice system sort of at, uh, on a whole to think about whether or not just always going to the next level of severity down is the answer. I mean, is it just a, a matter of degree to just get a little bit less severe or do we need to start thinking sort of more holistically about, about ways to address the criminal justice system? And I do think there are people moving in that direction now for the sort of more, more holistic rethinking. Um, and one other thing that I just quickly wanted to quickly wanted to add, I think this also comes in when you see someone in the chat or someone in the Q&A asked about moratoria that are in effect in other states, for example, Oregon and Washington and Pennsylvania are all under governor imposed moratoria. And that sort of lets things stay at status quo, but it hasn't been at least not in the same way that happened in Illinois. It hasn't been pushing those states at least as of yet closer to, to abolition, right? It sort of just pauses things. And obviously we have this in California too. So the question is, what do we need to also make that next courageous step that Governor Ryan ended up taking in Illinois? And, and I think that's, that's a tricky thing because it can be easier, I think, for governors to say, I'm gonna declare a moratorium, but I'm not gonna take that step forward, not gonna take that further step to commutations. And there can be reasons why it's more difficult because the power is constrained for the governor to take that step but there still needs to be the pressure, I think, for, uh, for that additional action, saying that the moratorium is not necessarily enough if you, if you see these issues. Well, actually, this leads into a question from uh, Gar Allen, another friend of Death Penalty Focus and Board of Directors member. Um, he asked you, Governor Ryan, he said, could you describe the political and other factors that eventually led the Illinois legislature and Governor Quinn to abolish the death penalty 15 years after you courageously um, initiated the moratorium? Well, I don't think anybody um, really wants to put it, put it back on. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, after I left, uh, there were mostly a Democrat governor that had been elected and they didn't have a desire to put the death penalty back on like a Republican would have had. And so I think that happened. And, uh, but it was it was a political decision, I'm sure, on the part of uh, uh, the governor Quinn to do it when he did. I'm glad he did, and uh, it's. Uh, but you, I guess I guess the question is, do I think it's coming back? No, I don't think so. And there's another question here for all of you too. Um, there are questions about the 2020 election, and people are asking, is there anything? In the Democratic platform, or that Senator, uh, or that um, Vice President Biden has stated, that would improve matters as far as abolishing the death penalty. 
Vice President Kamala Harris would help it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Because this is this really looms, and it, it, what I what I fear is that politicians just back away from the issue because they're not being pressed. You know, not being pressed to take a stand. And it's kind of a low priority issue in a lot of areas. So how, I mean, for all of you, you're so experienced and so smart. How should we look at this and how do we move forward? I, I, I want to back up, if I may, to the Please. comment that the question Steve asked actually, and it's ironic with, that he asked it, which I will explain. I think it's a question of um, incrementalism um, killed, stop the killing, and then we can work on the rest of it. Um, for many, the idea of life without parole is murder by another, uh, through another system, another form of the death penalty that a lot of people think of it as. Um, Steve, uh, the questioner, and I were once being interviewed in a, uh, on a television show with a, uh, uh, in, de in a debate format with another uh, a prosecuting attorney. District Attorney, I believe, and um, sorry. And um, during a break, we were putting up statistics and uh, all the arguments. And, and during a break, he said, "You know, you folks are not being straight here." I don't think that's quite what he said, but you folks, if you succeed in getting rid of the death penalty uh, by replacing it with life without parole, the next thing you're going to do is go is try to get rid of life without parole. And I said, "You're absolutely right." <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, I think those are choices that have to be made as we go down the line. But there are, there are steps. One has to accept the idea that there are um, answers that are not completely satisfactory, but they move us in the proper direction. I appreciate that statement about incrementalism. So, Governor Ryan? Well, I was going to say... Uh, a couple of things. First of all, I think there's about 2,600 people, 2,700 people are still on death row in the United States. The United States is a, one of the very few democracies uh, in the Western world <clears throat> that uh, executes criminals. Uh, other countries, uh, basically third world countries, are, are, are the ones that do the death row stuff, and the United States is tied right in with it. But it's interesting, the uh, statistic is that on the average, a convict has spent 15 years uh, waiting to have uh, the poison injected into him before uh, uh, anything happens. And 25% and of those people that are waiting die a natural death before they're executed. Uh, so uh, life in prison is not, uh, for life forever, is, uh, is not a joyride, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, a question here also says, um, Governor Ryan, have you been able to convince other governors or would you be willing to try to convince other governors to uh, initiate moratoria in their states? Well, um, I'm getting to be an old man now. I'm kind of had to slow down a little bit. But, uh, I'd be willing to do anything that I could do uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to cause that to happen uh, to, with other governors if I could do it, but I'm, I'm um, kind of retired a little bit now, but I'll, I'd be glad to help any way I could. A question from Oregon says that um, for states like Oregon that have rarely used the death penalty and currently have a governor imposed moratorium, how do you work to achieve abolition? Thoughts? I think, I think the incrementalism is the word there. Um, you know, I th in Illinois, um, when a new governor came in, one of the questions even before was, what are you going to do about the moratorium uh, after George left? And it's hard to undo it, um, it sort of from a political perspective, I think. Um, and so... Over time, what would essentially happen in Illinois is that governors didn't want to rock that boat and they, the moratorium stayed there. And then it became, well, what's the point? Let's get rid of it. 
And that's what happened. And I think that's what largely is what's going to happen in moratorium states. And, you know, we have what uh, Mike probably knows this better than me, but there's must be seven or eight or nine de facto abolition states because they haven't executed anybody. And I think there's six or seven that haven't, ex it's a, like a decade. Um, and so, you know, I think at some point we are going to reach this incrementally where it's, we don't, we're, we're fine without it. We don't need it. Um, what it takes to tip it, well, you know, you talk about whether or not it's in a particular candidate's platform. I mean, I think, it, I think it's pretty clear um, in terms of what the prospects are between the two choices coming up in November. We've got a, a sitting president who started up executions on the federal level and can't get them killed fast enough. So regardless, I think, of what's in the Democratic platform, um, I think the prospects are far better um, from that perspective. And a question here, too, from uh, Abe Bonowitz. He says, President Trump has been on a killing spree. Five executions in the past two months, two more scheduled next week. He says, what, how, Governor Ryan, do we approach conservative politicians at the federal level um, to encourage them to vote to abolish the death penalty? Well, I, you know, yeah, I suppose if you can convince some people uh, that it is, but. Uh, Nobody wants to look like they're soft on crime, and especially people that run for office, political guys. They, 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 the case uh, when Jim Edgar ran against uh, Don Clark Nick, a senator in Illinois, uh, she was a liberal and for all the death penalty. And he just beat her to death with it. It should have been a closer race than it was, but it was a death penalty uh, that, that, that uh, helped Edgar get elected. But, uh, you know, you, I, I just maybe I was a little different. And uh, when this came about for me, I was given a speech out in Oregon. And some reporter asked me if I, if we talk, I was talking about the commutation for everybody on death row. And he said, uh, well, you're going to do it for a few or everybody. I said, well, I haven't really given it a whole lot of thought. And I said, I, I, I don't know if there are, what kind of a decision or how I would go about making a decision who to do it uh, to and leave a few left and take a few. And uh, he kind of made fun of me. He said, oh, you're going you're gonna to commute the sentences on everybody. I said, you know, I just never thought about that. Thanks for telling me I may do that. Well, he thought I was nuts. Maybe he was right. I don't know. Uh, we have people here calling for you, Governor Ryan, to call the governor of Ohio about a moratorium. Would I? Yes. Well, uh, maybe. In fact, there are some very, we had a program on before with a legislator who was scheduled to speak from Ohio. He's a very conservative legislator out of a Republican district. He's Republican. And he's been urging that the death penalty be abolished in Ohio um, on the basis of, um, of innocence, but also on the basis of cost. And he sees that as being a way to make a mark, I believe. I will say Ohio is one of the states with the most robust clemency process as far as determining whether or not a person should be recommended for clemency, but still leaves the governor with the final authority to make the clemency decision. So the board makes a recommendation, but it's only a recommendation, but the process is still very thorough. And Ohio is actually one of the places where we see a lot of Republican governors granting clemency in individual cases. I mean, this is the this is sort of one of the things that's a little different than the mass grants is the use of clemency, just looking at the facts of an individual case, not stopping all executions, but stopping the execution in that case. And we've seen that with Governor, Governor Kasich commuted a lot of sentences, not on a mass grant, but on an individual basis. And actually, Governor DeWine in Ohio has repeatedly paused executions in the state. There's no moratorium per se, but he's basically said that he's not going to restart executions until he can feel confidence in the lethal injection protocol, which has not been changed. So that puts things sort of on, on pause. Um, 
on pause in Ohio. So it's interesting to see how the different systems also will contribute to, you know, it, one thing that I, I've learned in my research about clemency is that there is something in the Midwest death penalty states, you see clemency being used more than you see in the other high use death penalty states that are in the South. And that could be for a number of reasons that you see for what happened in Illinois. Then you look at Ohio, you look at even Kentucky that had two commutations in the last, in the last year in individual cases. Um, which I think is is sort of interesting to look at the different the different systems there and how they relate to whether or not the power gets used. And a common cuff on a tough on crime meme is that the death penalty is necessary so that prosecutors have leverage for a plea deal. Does anybody have any comment on that? Because that seems to be something that is believed. I think. All right, Nancy, okay. could you repeat that? Yeah, so the question is, prosecutors seem to use this uh, argument against abolishing the death penalty by saying that the death penalty is needed to um, uh, twist the arms of defendants so that they will enter a plea. Is there any evidence that that is true? I think it's quite, uh, it's being talked about in prosecutorial in the, in the progressive prosecutorial ranks as a totally unethical abuse of the system, but it is, I think, often used. Sure. I think what we were talking about before in terms of prisoners being the possibility of life without parole being as difficult to contemplate and really think through as, as even a death penalty sort of shows you that if that were the limited option, if that was where the incremental change were to go and life without parole were the highest penalty available, that would still seem incredibly, incredibly difficult for people to think about being faced with. And so you would still have a severe punishment to use as a plea deal. But I, I, I think in most cases where defendants are not willing to take a plea deal, it has much more to do with them, just from a capital defense perspective, much more to do with them and where they're coming at the case rather than what the actual system has available. So I think that's a bit of a, a misstatement by prosecutors about how powerful that actually is. I agree with you, actually. Um, I think we are just about ready to wrap up, and I would like to have a little closing statement from each of you. So, Governor Ryan? Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, everybody uh, for uh, including me here. And this is my first Zoom experience. And uh, I had to do a little study to, to get involved with it. But uh, I can see how it works. It works pretty well. If I was running for office again, I might try it to figure out a way to use it as a vote getter. Uh, it's good to see my friend Mike. Uh, and, and haven't seen him for a few years. But Mike, uh, I was growing one of these uh, for the virus. And I said, when it when it's over, I'll shave. But now I had to shave because I was on Zoom. So I got shaved. But uh, the death penalty is going to be abolished at some time, maybe not in my lifetime, but it's not going to be far away. As I said, I think it's a generational thing. Younger people are just not for that death penalty or that kind of punishment, I believe. And I think you'll see some changes in it. I don't know how soon, but I think that's probably going to happen. I'm hoping anyway. Good to I see you, Mike. So too. And Mike? <clears throat> yes. Uh, yeah, this is a this is a COVID beard, Governor. I <laughs> I'm sure I had one. <laughs> I um, I figured why fight it while I'm, nobody's seeing me anyway. Um, well, first of all, uh, I, I'm thrilled to be part of this. I'm thrilled to see you, Governor. I admire you more than I can easily say. I think what you did was her heroic and and historic. Um, and I think that you have provided an example of the kind of leadership we need in this country. Uh, Thank you. And ethical. Um, I, I believe, I agree, quite agree with you that uh, the death penalty is on the way out. I think we've made the extraordinary progress we've made in the, I guess, close to 40 years I've been involved in the issue, um, shows everywhere. And, and even but to go back to Abe's question, there are conservative organizations very actively opposing the use of the death penalty today on the basis of one, cost, and on the other, that conservatives don't believe that the government, uh, governmental bodies should have the kind of power they have. And, uh, and having the ultimate power to take the life of a human being is, uh, is contrary yeah. to many conservative views. Um, but I, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be part of this and particularly grateful to see you again, Governor, and thanks for, thanks for all the work. By the way, 
Uh, I, I've ordered a copy of your book. I have the manuscript that uh, Maurice sent me, but I'd love to get you to sign it for me if I can. Uh, as as I, I, I have not, I don't have a copy yet. There's okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll get, one to get it to you. Okay. I'll get one to you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mike. Laura? Thank you. Yeah, well, it was such an honor to, to be on this panel with all of you, and I really, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, I guess my one thing that I will, I will conclude with is I know, I, I agree that the approach to abolition comes with incrementalism and that we have to deal with life without parole because it does move the dial on death penalty support and we need to go in that direction. I will say as much as I, as much as I do practically agree with that, I hope people don't, uh, don't forget about mercy. Don't forget about what has been part of clemency, what has been part of the idea of clemency, even before it was just a way to sort of stop a system that obviously is horribly flawed, that there was an idea that clemency is about showing grace, is about showing mercy, that it is possible to do that for no other reason than you think it is a powerful, powerful thing to do. And that's something that did exist in our conception of criminal justice at various points in our history. It's not something that's totally foreign to our American thinking about it. It has sort of fallen out of the way we think about it now because things have gotten as far as they have. But this is just my, my plea to people to sort of look back at look back at Hamilton, look back at the founders, think a little bit more about why it would be essential even just to show mercy, even if it's not a wrongful conviction, even if it is someone who's guilty because that is a powerful, uh, powerful political, political tool as well. So that will be my, my pitch. Thank you, Maurice. No, I think that, uh, and thank you for this. I think this has been great. It's always great to see Mike. Um, and of course, you know, George and I are sort of joined at the hip these days, uh, at least virtually. I, 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 the book is, I think George's story is as relevant today as it was then, and perhaps even more. And I th think that it should be required reading for every governor for every legislator. Um, and if people wanted to think about doing something, s get a copy, send it to your legislator and say, read this book. Great idea. Um, and I think that, you know, what his journey, the story of his journey is, is really an, a powerful and uh, impelling story that can impel others to follow in those footsteps, um, those courageous footsteps. Thank you. I just thank you so much. You're a great hero, Governor Ryan. Thank, thank you, Mike. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. We don't see enough of you. Thank you, Maurice, my friend. And Laura, thank you all so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you again the next time. And donate to Death Penalty Focus. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.